Good afternoon, Copenhagen distinguished Summit. guests and fellow colleagues. Welcome to our CLC lecture series. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Dinesh and I'll be your MC today. The CLC lecture series is one of the platforms through which urban thought leaders share best practices, exchange ideas and experiences. We are delighted to have with us today Mark Watts from C40 for this lecture session. Mark Watts is Executive Director of C40 Cities, a network of mayors of nearly 100 of the world's largest and most influential cities, dedicated to delivering science-based and inclusive climate action. Under Mark's leadership, C40's team has grown from 30 to over 300, and C40 has focused on showing through city leadership how the world can have can half global carbon emissions by 2030. Given this context, today's lecture titled How Cities Are Leading Global Climate Action will aptly focus on why action at the city level is essential to avert the worst of the climate crisis. Mark will show that science-based uh, climate action necessitates the phase out of um, fossil fuels and will share case studies from global cities. Through this sharing, we hope to glean um, deeper insights to improve the sustainability of urban life, to create good green jobs and make cities better and healthier places to live. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to now invite Mark Watts to uh, give his sharing. Mark. Thank you. Thank you. It's really, really wonderful to be here. It's been unfortunately a few years since I've been back in Singapore, but I, I always love visiting here, always come away with loads of uh, new ideas and inspiration. So hoping to get that on this trip. Um, so I'm indeed going to talk to you about uh, why, I guess, quite obviously, I think cities are leading global climate action. That's what C40 is set up to do. The smiling people on the, uh, on the image here are four of our leading mayors. Um, the mayor of Kazon City, mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, who's also our chair, the mayor of Cape Town, uh, and uh, Mayor Gallego, who's the mayor of Phoenix. Uh, and I think if we have the next slide, please, you can, we can show you. C40 and the one after that, please. In fact, I'm going to come back to that. Let's get the next one as well, please. So this is this is the uh, the group of C40 cities. So we're um, the blue dots are mega cities around the world. It's an organisation of just under 100. That's a uh, a kind of limit that we keep for for this club. 97 at the moment. Mega cities, mostly three million plus population. Um, 800 million people collectively living in those cities, a quarter uh, of global GDP. And essentially, it's a, a club designed to empower the leaders of those cities, both the political leaders and then the, the civil service leaders, to be able to go faster than they would be able to on their own, to decarbonize their cities, to being strong, thriving, uh, green economies, uh, and to build popular public support for, um, for that shift. Um, but perhaps, more than that, more than delivering strong climate action in the cities themselves, increasingly, this is a group of leaders that want to, to collectively play their part to shift global markets, to move faster, to decarbonise, and to provide a really positive pole of attraction uh, of political leadership on climate action, because we only have to, to look at the news to see that we're still at an intergovernmental le level, to, to, despite lots of, of, of effort and focus, um, still not getting the level of global intergovernmental, intergovernmental commitment uh, that's, need, that's needed. And so we need, it's not instead of, but in, comp in complement to that, what C40 is trying to do is have another pole of global leadership that is supportive, that is showing leadership at a city level, that makes it easier, that helps uh, make that national action uh, move at the pace that science demands. Um, if we could just go back a slide, just this is, I think this is by, by reason of, um, I'm on a sort of a three week tour at the moment, I guess, in, in, in Asia, and it started out last week uh, in, in China. Uh, this was a gathering of, uh, for World Cities Day uh, in Shanghai, and, um, I think quite importantly here, the, the, the two people in the middle of the picture here, the uh, person in, in red is Mamouna Sharif, the executive director of uh, UN Habitat, the United Nations body that focuses on cities and the built environment. Next to her is the, the vice premier um, of China. Most of the other people in that photo uh, are mayors or party secretaries uh, uh, of cities in, in, in China. 
uh, and from around the world. And a you know, really strong gathering, what I particularly glean from that, I'm sure I'm, I'll talk about it as we go on for the, for the rest of the afternoon, but having not been in China for, for five years, just seeing the sheer pace and scale of shift to low carbon cities now uh, and surpassing in some sectors, just completely surpassing anything that's happening uh, in the rest of the world, although still some very big uh, problems there. And what was particularly uh, inspiring for me was seeing the extent to which the C40 member cities in China are really desirous to collaborate internationally uh, to work out. Always had a very strong relationship here uh, with Singapore, but trying to extend that uh, around the world not just learning from other cities to be able to go faster themselves, but now taking the incredible leadership in electric vehicles, renewable energy, their 15, the way they've interpreted the sort of 15 minute city livability, livable cities uh, concept. So if we can jump on a couple now of slides, please. Uh, so what we're uh, about at C40 uh, is uh, as a condition of membership of this club is that every city has got a robust, public plan for how it will reduce emissions within uh, the boundary of the city in line with, with science to stay under 1.5 degrees globally and build resilience into the city to cope with now the inevitable and growing impacts um, of climate change. We don't have any fees for, for membership in C40. You can't buy your way into the club. The only way you can be in the club is that you're demonstrably uh, a leading city in uh, becoming a prosperous, thriving low carbon city, if you don't meet those standards, then membership is lost. And every year we don't, this is not, we're not do, we don't do a name and shame, but every year there's one or, one or two cities that either do or are on the margin of losing that membership um, because we want to keep the club to be genuinely one uh, of leaders. Next slide, please. So we, we have kind of two broad missions that we're organized around. So that kind of top thing is the Paris Agreement, 1.5 degrees, fair share of, uh, of carbon emissions across the cities. But at the start of this year, our, our, our leadership, our mayoral leadership, um, agreed that actually we, we want to make it clear that our number one mission is helping the world get off fossil fuels. Because although it's the blindingly obvious thing in the, in the climate challenge, um, sometimes that reality of we can't just do the positive things to get out of this crisis, build more and more renewable energy, make our buildings ever more efficient. We've actually got to stop burning the fossil fuels that are causing the greenhouse gas emissions um, that, are, that are slowly killing us. And so our mission is to halve fossil fuel use within our member cities by 2030. This is extraordinarily difficult um, to do, not least because for, for most of these member cities, the primary levers they have are on the demand side only, not really the supply side in, the t in terms of energy, with the exception of you know, some cities that control their, their own um, energy utilities, which is why we make the second point there, that part of, of the mission is to win the global argument for the faster shift to renewables and stopping using fossil fuels, because we recognise this isn't, we're not just engaged in um, a straightforwardly rational um, race, looking at the data, following the information, decarbonizing economies, because that's what any sensible individual would do, armed with the knowledge about the threat of climate breakdown. But unfortunately, we have to confront vested interests who are making a profit out of those industries that are holding us back. And therefore, we have to overcome the arguments that they put in place to, to slow us all down. And what we've seen, particularly in the last 12 months, I would say, is not only that globally, for the kind of alt-right conspiracy uh, theory uh, world that climate has become a central organising principle for that milieu, but also that cities have, and, and political action at a city level has become a focal point of attack. So we've seen lots of kind of misinformation, disinformation about the 15 minute city that apparently is intended to confine people uh, to not be able to leave their neighbourhoods. Similarly, lots of attack on clean air zones in London, in Paris, Bogota. Um, we've even seen uh, attempts in some of our Latin American cities uh, to pass legislation in national parliaments to prevent mayors from buying electric buses 
because it is in, supposedly injurious to the national economy. So lots and lots of pushback, um, which we're now, as an organisation, uh, helping our mayors to confront. And then the second part, which is somewhat related to that, is to address the impacts and injustice of climate breakdown. Because often the most successful argument that the, the climate delayers, the climate deniers have, is the suggestion that moving rapidly to cleaner economies is somehow detrimental to people's immediate well-being and stalls economies uh, and cuts jobs. Of course, all the evidence suggests the reverse is true. And so our analysis in C40 actually is just on a, a quite conservative sort of measure of business as usual versus fast decarbonation decarbonisation pathway, there's about a third more jobs will be created in, or protected in C40 cities on the fastest of the, the low carbon scenarios. So uh, our aim is 50 million good new green jobs in C40 cities in the next 30 years. It's a target, but actually the way the target de was derived was how many good new green jobs would we need for those cities to deliver the carbon targets that they've committed to. So it's not really a target, it's really a, a, a goal that needs to be achieved. Um, unlocking investment for climate resilience in cities, this is becoming an increasing priority because we're all seeing climate impacts happening now. Sadly, the science of climate change has been, has been pretty accurate in general terms, but hasn't been able to predict the speed with which our climate is breaking down and particular ecosystems are, are coming to tipping points and therefore the severity of extreme weather. Um, and we're feeling that particularly uh, in C40 cities, but at the moment, only 9% of, of global climate finance is available for resilience. So that's good in one way. People's focus is on stopping the problem, cutting the emissions. But actually, if you're running a city where flooding is now becoming uh, a, a regular event that's affecting hundreds of thousands of people, you really need that money to flow. And then finally, improving uh, public health by making climate a health issue. So particularly with things like those clean air zones, we find even in, in the naming, an ultra low emission zone, not very popular. Clean air zone with exactly the same policies, very popular. Because people kind of get the extent to which polluted air is a driver of, of ill health. And so make it, let's make that the thing that we argue about, make that the point uh, of, of, of division. Next slide, please. Um, and as I said, there's two kind of two parts to what we do, two, what we do, two reasons why I would argue that cities are at the forefront of tackling uh, global climate change. One is because what's being done in cities themselves, and I'm mostly going to focus on that, <coughs> excuse me, but the, the other reason is because the leadership um, that is being shown. And we've got to kind of got to take the context here, even though it's a pretty negative one. Um, emissions are still rising globally when by all of the estimates for how we can stay under 1.5 degrees, they needed to have stopped and be declining since 2020. Uh, according to the International Energy Agency, there shouldn't have been any, not a single dollar, not a single cent of new investment in fossil fuels um, since 2021. Uh, in fact, 2022 was the record year for investment in fossil fuels, $1.4 trillion on the back of very high global prices and therefore very high rates of profit that can be achieved. <clears throat> the positive news here is in the bottom bit here. It's a bit double-edged, but three quarters of C40 cities are cutting emissions faster than their res respective nation states. I would argue they should be. You should see cosmopolitan, forward-looking big cities going faster than a whole nation state with all the complications of that. Um, but nevertheless, it's a, still a positive thing here that shows that it is possible and broadly speaking, broadly speaking, C40 collectively is on track to cut emissions in line with what's necessary to halve emissions by 2030 stay under 1.5, broadly, just about. Um, I think, you know, the last bit of context here is, I, I thought quite significantly, the, the incredible leader of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, quite pointedly said a few months ago, we're no longer in the era of global warming. We're now in the era of global boiling. We, we have demonstratively shifted uh, in terms of the intensity of climate uh, impacts. Record average temperatures every single month of this year um, across the globe. We, know, I don't, we don't need to go through the litany of climate impacts, but I think the thing in the conversations we have with the science scientists who advise C40, the thing that's most of most concern is how close the world now is 
to passing over some of the most important ecosystem tipping points, the points beyond which, on the basis of current science, we don't know how to put it back, Mo most significantly of which uh, the, the permanent melting of the Arctic um, ice shelf. Uh, you know, for two reasons. One, because the sheer volume of water if Greenland uh, fully melts, we're talking two to seven metres uh, of sea level rise, absolute unimaginable levels for, for cities uh, and humanity around the world, but also because of the, the role that that ice cap plays in slowing down the rate of, of, of global heating otherwise because of the reflection uh, of sunlight and, uh, and heat, and because of the impact of that melt on a lot of the other uh, uh, air and ocean uh, systems of the Earth, and we're, you know, we're seeing some, some quite significant changes as a result of that shift in the Arctic now down in the Amazon, which is, itself is on the verge of a tipping point from going, probably has passed, unfortunately, from being a carbon sink, drawing down carbon dioxide, to now producing carbon dioxide because there are so many uh, forest fires in the Amazon. I promise you that's, that's all the negativity. Uh, now, now to the positivity uh, and what's happening in cities. So next one, please. So this is, this is the, you know, the numbers here are a bit meaningless, but what this, what this graph is showing is we measure across all of the member cities in C40 the, the actions, the high impact actions, the things that make the most difference to reducing emissions in line with those science-based tar targets and aggregate them uh, together across C40. And what you can see here is just a nice steeply rising curve of delivery of those actions. And I think particularly importantly, there's no break for the pandemic. It wasn't the case for the C40 cities that COVID, despite all of its, its terrible impacts, stopped action on climate change. It certainly hasn't stopped the political resolve. We haven't seen, we haven't experienced as an organisation, mayors coming to us and saying, we've got to reduce these targets now. We've got to go a bit slower. We've got to kind of get back from COVID. On the contrary, the opposite has really been seen. The experience of the pandemic the incredibly intense collaboration between cities to solve a global problem that they were all experiencing at the same time has made it easier to do the same, have the same approach to tackling the global climate challenge. But actually the way that we <coughs> were forced to live during the pandemic and the way that it's made people think about how they want to live in cities has been in largely helpful to redesigning cities in a way that, that will make them lower carbon and more resilient to climate impacts. Next one, please. And I need to have a... <clears throat> a little sip of water. And in particular, <clears throat> we are seeing what I said earlier, the evidence starting to come in that there are more green jobs in the places in the cities that are moving fastest uh, to become um, the, the to become green cities. It's a bit hard here because the, the, the methodology is different across the world. We're trying to get a, to create a common methodology now. There wasn't a very good baseline, but we can say at the moment there's about 14 million very clear green jobs across um, C40 cities. But the one thing we're, we're very certain about from all the analysis that we've done is, however you cut it, the greatest opportunity for job creation in the big cities of the world is in things that will help solve the climate crisis. So particularly in the Western cities, in, in building retrofit uh, and design of, of clean construction, uh, transport, systems, the, the shift to electrification everywhere. Uh, in the global south, a lot of jobs in, in nature-based solutions to the climate crisis and to improving resilience. Uh, and we're even seeing, even though it's quite small scale, but we're seeing statistically relevant new job creation in things that you wouldn't have expected cities to be focusing on, uh, like agricultural production. And <clears throat> part of that's the experience of the pandemic for those cities who got perilously close to running out of food uh, at some of the, the peak moments of lockdowns. Now as a, as a resilience function are trying to build urban agriculture into the, into the fabric of the city. The next one, please. <clears throat> so in terms of, uh, of where there's that, that biggest focus, unsurprisingly, energy consumption in building, that's where 60% of uh, emissions come from. Um, it's where cities have the biggest impact uh, globally, 75%. Global emissions mostly coming from that. Uh, buildings. We've got 28 cities in C40 now who are introducing the regulations, the codes that will mean by 2030 at the latest uh, they've regulated for all new buildings to be net zero carbon and then a subset of those um, for, for 
uh, of having retrofitted, uh, like Seoul, um, all of their public buildings um, to be net zero carbon. I think on the next slide, we might have some examples of that. So you know, some of the big ones, these are probably very familiar to everyone in, in, in this very expert audience. But uh, New York's Local Law 97, which is a, a, a mandate uh, from the city government started with Mayor de Blasio. Uh, now Mayor Adams is implementing that all of New York's skyscrapers essentially, I forget the square footage that it applies to, um, have to very seriously retrofit to a, to a, to a city standard um, or face very, very high levels of fines, million dollar plus uh, fines uh, annually. It's, it's been quite an interesting one. I've been in, in, involved in quite a lot of the conversations in New York here. Quite a lot of opposition for the, from the real estate community initially when the law was suggested. Now you're much more li likely to find advocates amongst real estate uh, who've seen this as a, as a really big opportunity, um, stimulating lots of, of, of new customer demand for green building, lots of companies trying to entice people back into office space after the pandemic. One of the, one of the enticements is to have a healthier uh, office environment, um, which goes hand in hand with lower carbon, but also huge job creation stimulation in here, massive new demand for, <coughs> for renewable energy being stimulated from these developers. Quite a few of the big developers are now becoming uh, renewable energy supply companies as well um, as developers. So, you know, a little bit closer to home, um, probably the biggest, fastest scale of building retrofit in any uh, C40 city, particularly on the, the public buildings, the mandate of a, for every public building to have uh, a solar energy supply. I forget within the space of two, or two years, it was some incredibly uh, fast time coming out of the pandemic. In both cases, tens of thousands of jobs being created in the space of a few years. Next one, please. And then in, in transport, you know, the next biggest thing, third of emissions, number one source of, uh, of urban air pollution. 36 cities here we have uh, committed to make a major area of their met metropolis completely free of fossil fuel vehicles by 2030. But by 2025, um, at the latest, to be uh, procuring only zero emission buses. This is one of the ones where we've seen cities go much faster than the pledge was actually made. Because if we go on to the next slide, again, I'm sure very familiar. We've now got a raft of Chinese cities that I was seeing last week that already have 100% electric bus fleets, and they're huge. Guangzhou, 13,000 fully electric buses. And I was asking about the pace of change because when I previously looked at Guangzhou's electric bus numbers only a couple of years ago, they only had a handful. They swapped out 8,000 diesel buses for electric buses in 12 months in Guangzhou. It's just, you know, it's extraordinary. London, which is one of the leaders on electric bus, uh, buses in Europe, I think has now got to 3,000 in about a decade. Uh, this, you know, this pace in China is just completely off the scale uh, compared to everywhere else, but it is driving a global market. So we've got cities in Latin America that only a few years ago were being told by all of their bus suppliers, mostly North American and European, they weren't going to be selling electric buses in Latin America until at least 2030, probably 2035. Now, BYD and some of the Chinese manufacturers have come in. Not only have they made Latin America the second biggest in terms of our regions for bus electrification, but those European and North American suppliers have now changed their production schedules and are starting uh, to, to produce in there. What I thought was also interesting here, you know, in Guangzhou, this is at the um, GAC, now the third largest um, electric vehicle manufacturer in the world, municipally owned uh, and managed by the city uh, government, um, which has both got a revenue model for their electric bus company, which relied on massive public subsidy to do that 8,000 buses coming from the central government, no question about it. Uh, but now with that infrastructure in place, realizing that they're only using the charging infrastructure for the buses at night, mostly, they're now using those faci facilities commercially for cars to be charged uh, during the day, uh, but charged at fast charges that I don't know what, it, what they are here, but far outstrips what's available in Europe and North America. So in Britain at the moment, the fastest superchargers, 150 uh, kilowatts, which means that the, a, a, a Tesla can recharge its battery in about 20 minutes to about 80%. In Guangzhou, 480 uh, kilowatts, and they're about to, about to roll out 600. Uh, kilowatts, which effectively means now, and with cars that have a range of 780 kilometers, it's, a, it's pretty much the time taken to 
refuel your electric car is the same as your petrol or diesel car. And in fact, this picture here, I uh, didn't pick up the point. Actually, I had a clicker, didn't I? I keep asking for the slides to be changed. I could be doing this myself. Sorry, lazy. Uh, this is their, their trialing here, um, a battery swapping system for recharging. So cars designed with all the batteries uh, underneath uh, the chassis. I saw it in operation here, two minutes. So effectively two minutes to 100% refuel your car. The model, the commercial model at the moment is, it's, you, it, it wouldn't be the only way you'd re refuel. So you'd, you'd plug in sometimes, but six times a month on a subscription, you can completely swap out the batteries. Fully, fully AI automated, uh, needless uh, to say, and cars just kind of coming in, dropping the batteries, new batteries, uh, straight, straight out in the, in the blink of an eye. It does very much seem uh, like, the, like the future. Um, and perhaps on that note, that kind of in innovation uh, and collaboration, this is always what we're looking for in C40 is, is the city or one or two cities uh, that have done something first, but that could be quickly copied and replicated elsewhere. And it'll be much cheaper and easier to be rep copied elsewhere based on that learning. I've deliberately not put examples from Singapore in here because you all know them, but Singapore is absolutely one of the, the leading cities in the world that, that as you know, other uh, people from cities around the world flock to, to see what you've been doing here in the extraordinary way this, this, this city state has developed uh, over the last few decades. We tried to put on here a few things that might that might you know might appeal to Singapore that might be even Singapore isn't fully doing at the moment. I don't know, but um, we've got twelve cities now actually that are, that are following Oslo's um, example. Oslo, you know, one of the, you know, de the the leading city in Europe definitely in terms of its it, its decarbonation. The only one that's close to Chinese cities in terms of vehicle electrification, one hundred percent renewable public transport, incredible uh, high standard of uh, of building design, um, really now investing in clean construction. But the mayor there, sadly, mayor has just finished his, his, his term, uh, Mayor Johansson. He didn't feel his government was doing enough. He didn't feel, despite all of the successes, that the government was fully focused on the climate challenge. So he brought in what he's called a climate budget, which he changed the, um, the law, the, le the legal basis of city government <clears throat> so that now future mayors are not allowed, can only pass the annual financial budget, <clears throat> excuse me, if they can demonstrate that the expenditure of the city will lead to the delivery of the annual carbon budget target. And in partly in doing that, he's made delivery of the climate plan, the responsibility of the finance department, the most powerful department in pretty much any city government. And over a four or five year period now, <clears throat> that's led them to massively accelerate their climate action because they started doing things that they hadn't even dreamed of before, like looking at the school meal program and how they could shift to plant-based protein um, to decarbonize school meals, or how they could better procure the supplies for the police and fire services as a way of reducing um, waste within the system. It's, I think it's a really exciting program. It's um, a lot of 12 cities around the world now piloting that with Oslo's help, including uh, Mumbai, which is taking up in a, in a very uh, big way in Rio uh, in Brazil, as well as London and LA and Paris. Um, Tokyo, Kuala Lumpur, this is an example of, of, of mostly in C40, we're doing multi-city collaboration, but here's a really good example of, of bilateral. It's probably a decade old now that Tokyo has been doing uh, a carbon trading scheme for um, uh, emissions across its, its large building sector very successfully. I mean, like, I can't remember the numbers, but 20, 30% reduction, I think, in their emissions as a result of the carbon trading. But now a, a program, a bilateral program to help Kuala Lumpur introduce exactly the same, or not exactly, a, a cap and trade scheme of a similar type adjusted uh, to, to their circumstances. And we really want to have more of that bilateral. We've done similar things with, for example, Copenhagen helping Beijing uh, to decarbonize its, its uh, district heating uh, system with, with great results. Often that two cities working very closely together uh, uh, really can work. Uh, and Jakarta, <coughs> which you know, one can very much see learning uh, from Singapore, but here trying to, they've been successful not only in massively expanding their public transport system, <coughs> I'm gonna have to have some more water, apologies, but I think equally importantly, 
as they've expanded the system, they've reduced the proportion of average income spent on public transport uh, by 10 to 30 percent, which is making it more affordable as well as a higher quality at the same time. <coughs> and that, if, um, if that could be replicated around the world, we'd see a lot more change a lot faster. Um, coming to a close here and, and thinking, going back to where I started in that advocacy role um, <coughs> for cities, this, the, the COP that's about to happen uh, in Dubai, COP28, um, I don't think anyone really is, is expecting this to be a breakthrough climate talk in terms of uh, and it, suddenly a big acceleration in terms of, of shifting out of fossil fuels. <clears throat> It'd be unlikely if that was the case in, in something hosted by a petrostate. But what the UAE has been very committed to is changing the nature of the climate talks so that they're not just about the negotiations between the governments, but that there's, there's a much more visible role for the other actors that are demonstrably shifting global, the global economy uh, to zero carbon. And so when the presidents and prime ministers are meeting this year in the first couple of days of the COP, alongside that, there'll be a local leaders summit that brings in governors uh, and, and mayors um, from around the world that C40 has been very uh, focused on. Um, this is not just a sort of platform to sort of brag about the success in the cities, but it's intended to make a real contribution to helping countries think how they can increase the ambition in the nationally determined commitments, which are nowhere near in most cases what's needed at the moment. Uh, you can see on the graphic there, we've produced uh, an NDC ambition handbook. So a, a kind of advice, essentially, an offer to national governments for how they could work with cities and with international city organizations to increase that ambition. We think only 30% of current national commitments have taken account fully of what's happening at a city uh, level. Um, but also we're making, we're making a proposal uh, and, and ask for a handful in the first instance of, of national governments to commit to formally looking at that, what's being delivered at a city level, how could it be enhanced, accelerated by stronger partnership with national government, what would that mean for the national commitment, could that be the difference in getting to where science demands, <clears throat> and then bring that back to COP30 in Brazil. Uh, so we change the nature of the climate talks themselves, we've got to because it's not been working. You've got to change the way they work. Um, and this is something we're working with Bloomberg Philanthropies, but also with the Under Two Coalition of Governors. <coughs> I think I've got to stop now because my voice is about to give out. Um, but hopefully that's a bit of a suggestion for why city leadership on climate uh, is more important than ever. And this is the perfect place uh, to be having that conversation where there's been so much leadership over so many years. I'm looking forward to the conversation that follows. Thanks very much. Join us on stage uh, for the moderated Q&A session. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. One of my colleagues will come around with a mic. Um, and do state your name and organization before asking the question. I'll now hand over the time to Michael and Mark. Okay, thanks. Okay, sorry. No, I'll just switch this. <clears throat> Okay, thanks very much, Mark, for the inspirational talk. Um, how many of us think that climate change is real? Just put up your hands. I presume most of us, right? But if you can just imagine if you're living in, in a small town deep inside a big country, you, know, you, you don't feel this and, and you don't realize it. And hence, there, there are some very developed economies whereby you have so many climate change deniers. And you can understand why. They probably say, oh, the snow is late this year. <coughs> or oh, spring is a bit late and spring rains are not happening, etc. But they're isolated. There are many people who are isolated like that. But yet, you know, in, a, in a visit to Sri Lanka that some in CLC made, you can see actually fishing communities by the coast actually flooded over. And, and they can't live there because they are totally flooded out. And these were fishermen who lived by the coast. Uh, aching out, uh, taking a living by just cut, uh, you know, taking the boats out, etc. And it's flooded over. And then you realize that, hey, something is happening and, and, and it is real. But then what's the solution also? Because in Colombo, they put these fishermen in 10-story 
high-rise buildings and said, this is your freehold property in exchange for your fishing village. And being fishermen, how do you survive in a 10-story building? <laughs> where do your boats go? Where do your nets go? Etc. So, so these are real issues at hand. And I don't think there's any direct answer or, uh, or direct solution. But I think most of the world is trying its best. The mayor of Darwin has said that I am going to plant a million trees. And it's trees, trees, trees. That's what he's going to do. And you think of Darwin, it's a tropical climate. And yet, the mayor is saying, trees, trees, trees. And that's a statement. How, how, what are you going to do for the future? And then you realize that actually Darwin also faces immense uh, storms from climate change. So the trees are uprooted and trees just go flying you know, in the typhoons. And, and then you realize why the mayor is advocating more trees because there is no choice to reduce the heat that accumulates in, in very uh, tropical and hot and humid Darwin. So, but just back to the discussion, Mark, a few questions here. And we'll, we'll treat it as a conversation. Because uh, at, at the UN Climate Conference in September 2023, this year, uh, I think it showcased the way forward for the alignment of uh, sectoral, local, national, and international plans and policies with, as you said, credible and science-based targets to accelerate decarbonization advanced climate justice and fairness with an unprecedented level of coordination and cooperation and the renewed focus on credibility and accountability. Or so says the official website, right? And C40 was actively involved, I think, in all these discussions. But based on all these, well, I would say quite motherhood statements, what do you think will be the biggest challenges to the urban climate action in, in the next three to five years? Well, I think there's, there's lots of answers to that, aren't there? I think, I, know, I think the two biggies I, I, I go for is, is one, just being able to adapt fast enough to climate impacts that are bigger and harder than even the worst models had, had anticipated. But two, actually, we, you know, we, no city can escape the global context in which we're working, which is emission, investment in fossil fuels sh should have ceased, and yet it's hitting record levels. And that makes it very hard, whatever good stuff is done, whilst money is still being invested in, in bringing in new, pulling oil and gas out the ground and new infrastructure, it's going to be impossible to hit those targets. So I think it's, you know, it's those two big global things, but perhaps you know, that, the adaptation, the resilience, one of the, that's the one I see, I'm getting the most feedback on from mayors now, where they really want help, they really want collaboration because that one, they're just not seeing the dollars flowing. So particularly for our Global South member cities, already there's not nearly enough multi-level, uh, multilateral development bank support for climate action in cities anyway, but when only 9% of that is for adaptation and resilience. You know, ex for exactly cities as you've, as you've described that are experiencing extraordinary damage to infrastructure, loss of life, very large scale climate migration now. So. Dakar, Mayor of Dakar North says every time we see him, 2,000 people a day migrating into his city, most of whom are now climate migrants from elsewhere in, in Bangladesh. When you've got that scale of stress, it, to, to, to be told the only money that's available is to help you cut your emissions, not, not to, make, to protect your city from the impacts you're, you're it, you know, is pretty tough. So I, I think that's probably the biggest challenge of all. Right. I think you brought up a really interesting point about uh, people going to cities and cities not being able to access financing. Because atypically, uh, a lot of the World Bank and Asian Development Bank, multilateral bank financing goes to countries. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't necessarily trickle down to cities. <clears throat> so that leads me to the next question, actually. Well, uh, COP27 talked about loss and damage fund to rescue and rehabilitate uh, stricken communities. Um, I read at the BB, in the BBC or the Guardian in, in UAE, uh, in Abu Dhabi, uh, some agreement has been reached on such a fund recently, and this will be presented in COP28. Uh, 
So just thinking, what do you think are some of the innovative financing mechanisms for cities to use to support climate action efforts? And how can cities access them? We do need to see direct, the ability of cities to access that global finance directly. We, you know, it was only innovative in the sense, as you say, it's not happening at the moment. Um, but we need to find a way of um, creating those global funds that is acceptable to sovereign nations, but doesn't require every time a sovereign nation decision before money can flow, particularly because we, you know, we, of we often find in with C40 members, a, di a political difference between the city mayor and the national leader means that city, whatever its level of need, is not going to be able to access uh, access funds. I think, you know, more more generally though, we're 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 seeing cities that are that are trying to uh, find new forms of revenue streams that they through their through their own regulation and own uh, partnership. You know, I thought it was interesting in in Guangzhou. You know, it's not tremendously revelatory, but to just be thinking how to really sweat that infrastructure of the of a bus garage and turn it into something that then is a refueling infrastructure uh, for, for for private cars. They're going a bit of a stage further than that. You know, this that's something almost any city could do if it was forward thinking enough and, and had access to, to that first investment for, uh, for the infrastructure. Um, they're going a stage further there and thinking then about how uh, they can exploit price differentials uh, between kind of peak peak cost of electricity uh, and sort of lower cost at night. Uh, and so they can effectively have some of those cars not charging, but actually selling power back to the grid. So, you know, you could, you could start to see some of the, the kind of marginal capital cost differences at the moment, but things, things like electric bus infrastructure or indeed higher standard uh, buildings being managed through that kind of use of, uh, of municipal funds. But I, I think, you know, probably more than anything, it's going to be where we can start to see the, some kind of cap and trade schemes being introduced at municipal level. And actually that, particularly being in China, you could see that's been one of the main drivers of release of, of capital for all of those cities. They've got a national system just for the fossil fuel industry, but at provincial and city level, it covers a lot more sectors. Uh, and a sector, you know, talking to the, the CEOs of the electric car companies, they, they're saying, well, yeah, you know, basically, the conventional car companies through the credit system are now financing our investment. That's, that's as it should be, the polluter pays. Right. I think a very interesting case in point, um, <clears throat> how cities in China are actually advancing technology and uh, especially as you say in the case of the EVs, etc. But, but these are cities, so cities are able to accommodate, but there's much criticism leveled on a country like China because on the national grid, they're still generating power from coal. Not necessarily everything is renewable, but the cities are getting it clean. But on the national level, you, they're not. So, what do you think of that? Well, you know, I, th you know, I think it's tough. It, it's genuinely tough for China because, and, and, they, and there's a, it's very difficult to get an accurate picture of what's happening in at, le at least in in the West. But, you know, on the one hand, this is a country that last year, forty percent of all the new wind power all the new solar power that came on in the world was in China, in one country. 90% plus of all the electric vehicles in the world are in China. So two of the most important sectors for, for decarbonizing our world are being absolutely led by investment uh, in China. On the other hand, sadly, we saw the reversal of the trend of, of, of reduction in investment in coal last year. And, and actually in a kind of rebound from the pandemic, record investments, you know, the, the normal thing was a new coal power station every week. Actually, last year, it's two new coal power, power stations every week uh, in China. But it's, it's you know, which we do not wish, we don't, we, don't, we don't want to see, but they are still a, an economy that has only just eradicated poverty, um, albeit they did it in record time. But this is still a country of, of quite significant low levels of development alongside very high levels of development. And I don't think they should be beaten over the head for not being able to just turn off the tap on coal immediately. They are, they're, it's very clear, this, they're, they're really serious at every level of political leadership in decarbonizing the economy and doing it incredibly 
quickly. I was I was really struck by the change in uh, in in urban planning um, in China since I was last there. You know, going into that extraordinary urban planning museum in in Shanghai and seeing a whole section devoted to the 15-minute city, which is now the planning norm for all new developments in Shanghai, including the five new neighbourhoods, as they, they call them to us, but are actually uh, cities of a million people just within the municipal boundary of Shanghai, designed on a 15-minute city principle. I mean, the first thing I, I was saying this to Alice when we landed, Shanghai, Shanghai looks like Singapore now. You know, they, it's, it's, it's green. It, 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 didn't, it didn't used to be. It, there's, there's just there's green ev everywhere, flowers alongside the, the highways, every building are, you know covered in, in greenery, trees lining um, every road. The, the expansion of the metro system it, it, absolutely extraordinary. Seventeen lines already, another ten uh, being built. You know China is racing towards a clean energy future. It's just got a really difficult problem to solve in that it's only domestic fossil fuel is is coal. You know, you know, last thing to say in it is, I, I probably shouldn't say the name of the city, but in, in, in one of the confidential discussions we were having with, with, with one of the big cities in China, and we just asked, what's the number one thing where you want C40s help? It was, well, we've now stopped using coal. We shifted to gas. We want to get off gas within the next five years. Mm -hmm. Show me the cities that have done that. And I think that's the measure of the thinking at the moment. Well, thank you very much for that observation. And um, I guess putting things in perspective in terms of a development time frame, I think that's often misunderstood as uh, countries progress. But yet, um, well, Singapore is a, a small city state. We, we don't have a huge hinterland whereby we, we can adjust figures up and down. So, and we, we, of course, can't generate uh, renewable energy ourselves, and we have to import it from surrounding uh, countries. But you have what you have said is very important in the sense that uh, cities can lead the way in climate initiatives. And I think our, our ED just came back from Cape Town, and Cape Town certainly his observation is that Cape Town is moving towards uh, renewable energy despite having a, a clear national uh, policy of uh, action. So the city moves ahead of the country. Uh, I think this morning, uh, Milag was talking a lot about Quezon City, which uh, uh, has created uh, 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 thousands of green jobs. And I think these are exemplary examples. Um, but uh, I'd like to tap your mind on, or your opinion, on what have been other examples of successful C40 cities. And a little bit on the other side, which cities in the C44 you think can do better? <laughs> well, our first question, that's my favorite topic. The second, <laughs> don't, don't like to talk about. I mean, I mean, there's so, so many examples. I th you know, that South African example, I think is great because here you've had city, city leaders lobbying the nation state to give them the freedom to, to invest in renewable su energy supply for their city rather than having to buy from the coal-fired power station, which is, is fantastic. Not least because there are so many jobs dependent on that coal industry at the moment. So this is a tough political ask, and they've really got to take their people with them. I mean, I, th I think you know some of the other examples that for me, particularly in thinking of the of a city state of the high level of development of Singapore, the way that Copenhagen, which has been through a similar journey, you know, people forget with Copenhagen, but it it's it's only recently transferred out of coal-based district heating, uh, and its energy utility was a coal utility, it's now a 100% renewable energy utility. And that was largely city and some national demand that, that made that happen. But that they've, dis, you know, despite that, they're still redoubling their efforts to improve the efficiency in their system. And they've got, they've managed to create what is effectively a building, a unified building management system for all of the public buildings in the city of Copenhagen. So designed the software, brought together the different uh, agencies that has enabled them to amalgamate those different systems that now gives them the capacity to manage energy much at a much more um, minute level. You know, and I'm, I'm not an engineer, so they, I understand this only in very layperson's terms, but it, it means 
they can turn off the freezers in the school for half an hour when they need to reduce peak demand so that that remaining coal-fired power station never needs to be turned on, for example. So that bit of flexibility in the system, um, so it's an example, I think it'd be, be great to see copied around the world. I think the way that Los Angeles, which you know, is another example actually of moving against the tide it, during the period where President Trump uh, was in office, LA decided that it was going to, and you know, LA, we forget, LA is a city built on oil. You know, the, the, literally built on oil. There are oil wells all around the city of LA. Um, it has now um, banned any new prospecting for oil within the very large metropolitan boundary of Los Angeles and planned to get to 100% renewable electricity 2035. I think they'll get there a lot earlier. The last time, I think they're up 60, 70% already. But on the back of their, their municipally owned utility company, uh, building huge solar uh, arrays, really using the building regulations to its max. But actually the innovation has been really investing in um, battery storage uh, that allows them to, to better manage that grid. Uh, and again, an example I, th I think that can be utilized elsewhere because what they've had to do, and here's the difficult thing in a long answer, to hit those targets, they've had to close, announce the closure of their gas power plants 10 years ahead of schedule. 10 years ahead of schedule in a highly unionized industry with very good, well-paid jobs. And so the city has guaranteed that everybody currently employed in that sector will have a job, new, be retrained for a job in the new, renewable energy industry. But it's, this has not, not been smooth. There's been huge protests and organized against it, but they seem to be turning the tide now. They seem to be getting communities on side. So perhaps it's a lesson for how to make that just transition as well. I didn't answer your second bit, no, did I? Didn't. I was just coming to it. <laughs> you, you cited a very good example, I'm sure, because of the city like the Canadian Your frank opinion, which other cities, or which other cities you think can do better? I mean, it's genuinely really hard for me to kind of, uh, as the, the chief executive of an organisation, to criticise our members in public. We do, <laughs> we, we do do that in private. But, no, but I can say the challenges that are out there, you know, just I've just been in Hong Kong, um, you know, and the contrast in the proximity to Guangzhou and Shenzhen, and then looking at that aging fleet of diesel and LPG buses and taxis. And here seeing, you know, th this is one of the problems of scale actually. Um, they drive on a different side of the road in Hong Kong. So at the moment they're not getting access to that extraordinary production of cheap uh, electric vehicles just across the border. Uh, they decided to go their own way with the size of their buses for very good reasons of, of maximising public transport usage, which again has put them outside of, uh, of the market. The topography of the city um, is difficult. They're using double-decker buses. You know, you, so you see a city that 10 years ago was very much ahead of its neighbours that's now falling behind uh, in one instance. But, I, you know, and I think generally the experience of Singapore, um, Hong Kong shares in... It, it, it simply has not got the space to provide the renewable energy that it needs on site. And so that it's got to make some difficult choices about um, either buying carbon credits or, 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 or buying supply of renewable, renewable energy from, from mainland China, which is, I think is, is what it will do. You know, elsewhere, where do we see, you know, I'm thinking in the region here, you know, Jakarta, incredible example on that shift to, um, to, to, elect, to its, it expanding its public transport system. On the other hand, the lack of management of waste in the city is one of the reasons why flooding is such an extraordinary problem in a city that is, is also sinking and is experiencing some of the biggest problems of sea level rise of any city. You know, the capital city has already been moved, hundreds of thousands of people affected each year. And there's a real challenge for the city to do some really basic things in collecting waste and keeping that plastics out of the rivers that then blocks the storm drains etc so i think i think you know every city's got a got got the challenges that go along with the the successes what i haven't seen yet is a problem in one city that hasn't been solved in another so there is evidence that it can be done we just need to get the solution to them and the investment that makes it possible and i, I think it's great that uh, platforms at c40 offers platforms that we offer at the World City Summit uh, do provide that 
sharing of experience and knowledge between cities and leaders. But uh, I'd like to bring the, uh, the discussion beyond cities now uh, and think of it on a regional scale and mm -hmm. then a global scale. So what are some good examples that we can cite of the regional uh, cooperation or even global cooperation? Well, I think, you know, there's the, I referred to one regional one uh, earlier, which is, is that, that Latin, Latin America and the shift to, to first electrifying uh, their fleets. I guess the extra bit to that story is it was the determination of the mayors right across the region there to collectively go to the big manufacturers that, that, that change the situation and do it. They, they use C40 as the forum to do that. We gathered together, gather the evidence, but it was um, a, a, a sense of regional identity that allowed them to work in that way and not just work um, individually. We're, <coughs> we're, <coughs> excuse me, starting to see that more and more with our African cities as well at the moment. I think they're it's, at the moment, it's, it's the level of a conversation about how do they how how do they attract investment in renewable energy in a continent where gas is plentiful and cheap, and where there's a lot of pressure from their domestic gas industry to utilise that that natural resource that's already in their continent rather than at the moment what it looks like is buying foreign made renewable energy installation. How, so how do you create the jobs? How do you get the industry um, in that region to work together? Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, they're, they're, they're probably, of all the regions we work in, they're probably those are the two with the strongest sense of regional identity, I would say. Um, and, you know, and noticeable, perhaps they're two Global South regions. We don't, we see, we see a bit of that cohesion in Europe now, mainly at the level of, of because there's a, a, a regional government. So we've, we've had a delegation of, of European mayors recently through C40 lobbying the European Union in the context of the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine to change the Euro regulation at a European level to accelerate a shift to air source heat pumps as a way of reducing demand for electricity in buildings rather than buying up gas supplies in Africa as a way of getting off Russian gas. Uh, and I'm, I'm quite hopeful that that will have some effect. Second example was, on, was the global, was the global level. Well, you know, I think the, so mo most of what C40 does actually is, is global. And what's really uh, is constantly uh, giving me reason for optimism is that despite all the, in, in, the cultural, the economic, uh, the, the governmental differences between cities, most, most things, cities can really work at a, at a, at a, a global level. So we're, we're about to launch a new initiative in C40. A, 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 it's a, a water safe, water safe uh, cities accelerator. This is about um, being able to guarantee clean, safe, potable water supply uh, but also to manage water infrastructure in a way that is, uh, is, is friendly to nature and allow some of those global biodiversity goals to be achieved, in particular a, a third of, of a city being a green protected area, stuff that Singapore has done, done very well uh, uh, over the years. And that when I look, I look at the cities that are, that are potentially going to be part of that water safe accelerator, it's, a, it's not just the very advanced cities in the global north, it's, it's a good chunk in Asia and in, in Africa uh, and one or two in in, um, in Latin America as well. So, yeah, I think most you know most of the things we do are an example of that global collaboration. Right. Well, thank you, thank you for that. And, um, I think I'm going to take a pause for the questions and open up <coughs> the audience. Uh, I'm, I'm going not not to ask for volunteers. I'm going to arrow some questions out because I notice we have a transport expert and we have a master planning expert. Oh. in the audience. So maybe, uh, Dick Sun, uh, a question from you, and, and Wynn, uh, a question <laughs> from you as well. <laughs> These are the tough questions about to come in, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. Wow. Um, really arrow me. <laughs> 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 uh, 
uh, for LT. I think that's some LT stuff as well. Um, I'm quite interested in regional cooperation, actually. Uh, just now, Michael, you alluded a bit on that. Uh, if you can shed some light on, especially ASEAN region, uh, knowing Singapore, we are right in the centre, so to speak, uh, what do you see as how much we can do transnational in terms of uh, action for climate change? Well, I, I, I think you know, you and the, the centre here already does a huge amount of that, don't you? Because the the example of how Singapore has developed so rapidly and so sustainably over a, a short number of decades is is very much a model that you know in C forty we you know we see as being able to take and try and 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 try and transplant. I, you know that the 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 future of sustainable cities has to be compact and dense, but also green and I. I think one of you know, for we we've been working on the concept of of the fifteen minute city long before it was called that, but it's wonderful to see that it's now being taken up so strongly and such a transnational basis. When I look at the cities in C forty that have adopted that concept, in 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 one way or another, it spans the entirety of the gold. I would say gone absolutely mainstream in China, absolutely mainstream in Latin America, mainstream in Europe, but controversially so. Um, in, in that, it, that there's been a lot of missing and disinformation that's leading it to, be, to to come under attack, but the but the concept is sound. The US and, and Australia adopting it, but it 15 minutes seems impossible to achieve in cities designed for the car in in incredibly sprawling. But still, we're we're seeing it. If it's 20 minute, it's a that broad concept that everyone ought to be able to access everything within a short walk, cycle or public transport trip. And what everything is, is not just jobs and health services, but it's access to public space, to green space. And that's what that's what a good life is in, what a livable uh, city is. And I, I think, I've, that's really, you know, my professional life that has dramatically changed. Those were concepts where our colleagues used to groan at us when we talked about those things. And the idea that you would have a major part of a, a big, powerful city, a major part of its transport system would be people cycling and not just poor people who couldn't afford anything else, but bank managers and senior public officials cycling to work. And, that, you know, in, in London, it's extraordinary, the shift in, in the last decade in particular. So, I, you know, I feel that above all, that's concept. I learned something today. I can't remember whether it was you or Michael who said it earlier, but I learned something today of the concept of the two minute city uh, concepts for for, for, what did you say, for the active older people, active, uh, aging. active aging uh, people. I love that concept. So that's my, that's my first lesson from Singapore on, on this trip, that we need to design communities uh, for active aging people so that the, the services they absolutely need, particularly the health, are right there uh, on the doorstep. But the, the communities are designed to, to be active for as long as is, is humanly possible. And what's humanly possible is changing. So maybe that's the next concept to, to be taken globally. So for those in the audience, we were talking about Kampong Admiralty. Oh, yeah. Two minutes. You know, yeah. you literally take a lift up and you go up there. Uh, and you get access to it. Uh, over to a master planning question. Any question? Anyone? Can I ask the transport? Yes. Yeah. I'm from CLC. I was just, uh, thanks for your very inspiring lecture. I was uh, very interested in how Bangso was able to convert its um, buses so quickly to electrification because um, without waiting for the end of life or its fleets, right? Um, do they, is there like a lot of incentive given by the government or do they ship out their buses to other cities to erase their sins? To <laughs> <laughs> so erase their sins. Like, yeah, I mean, the straightforward answer is yes. This was a massive central government subsidy to prove that it could be done and to stimulate the domestic electric bus industry. But it is much more than that, I would say, because I think that story can be told in a Western capitalist kind of context. And it, oh, you know, it's just the big state intervening and you know, you could, that can't work everywhere and it's only, only in China. But it's, it's actually not, it's a story of extraordinary innovation because that same municipal authority at more or less the same time also decided you know, there's, there, there's something in this vehicle electrification. It's not happening, the market's not delivering fast enough. Let's create our own company. 
let's 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 start a municipal municipal electric vehicle company that's going to create jobs in our city to provide the kind of vehicles that we want for our city at the kind of price that our citizens uh, can afford and that you can see now it's so palpable that's now given them that knowledge of of what goes into the manufacturing of the vehicle is changing the whole public policy in terms of the the, the infrastructure <coughs> that's being put in place and I this is actually Shanghai rather than Guangzhou, but I thought it was extraordinarily striking that the ratio of electric cars to charging points in Shanghai is, is 1 to 1.5. The design standard not remotely achieved in the European Union is 1 to 10. Currently in, in London, 1 to 11. And that, that's, that's been achieved by the Shanghai Municipal Authority regulating that you can only get a license the manufacturer, it's on the onus on the manufacturer, can only issue a license plate for an electric vehicle if it provides a, d a domestic charging point for that customer, or domestic or commercial, a charging point for that customer. So again, <coughs> it's, it's the right incentive way around. The, the company has had to get a financial model where they can produce cars at a price that can be afforded with that tax on the top, essentially, but they've the, the 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 car companies themselves have to become the experts in the delivery of the the charging infrastructure, uh, and it, you know it's going to be self replicating. Thirty four percent of the vehicles on the road in Shanghai when I was there were electric. Thirty four percent is extraordinary, and and actually it's 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 higher than the actually the ownership. It's twenty percent of the cars that are per that are owned are electric, but because they're so much cheaper to run, the electric cars are used much more. Than the non-electric, and you know this is just so far ahead of everywhere else. So I think, yeah, public subsidy, and we shouldn't be ashamed of it. it public investment. It, the only way we're going to get out of the climate crisis is through public in, investment, creating and shaping then the markets into which the private sector can also plough in investment to do, to produce the the kind of things, the stuff that we need to have safe, clean, livable cities rather than at the moment all the, you know that's the, the great problem with the fossil fuel industry all the incentives are the wrong ones you know the public subsidies are so great that it's profitable to invest in the things that are killing us when it should be it, it should be massively unprofitable to invest in any new gas and oil uh, i think another very interesting point that you raised incentivizing and how do you enter into partnerships and how can cities do that? Mm. So maybe one day put some LTA <coughs> own shares in the future <laughs> bus company of Singapore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. all the more, there you go, you own the bus and store, change, change your mindset. But, uh, 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 and I think another aspect is that the design is really progressing. I mean, if you look at uh, the old cherry vehicles that came to Singapore and you look at the new mm. engines, the BYDs, they are really beautiful, yeah. uh, beautiful machines. Uh, just take a look at the BYD showroom at Suntec City, for example. Amazingly designed, really top quality. Mm, absolutely. Uh, and the door slams beautifully. <laughs> it doesn't go clank like the old cherries. Uh, I, I think, uh, Lady in Green, uh, please identify yourself and you have a question. Uh, I'll move on to this side of the room. <coughs> question next. Hi, I'm Jinan. I'm actually visiting from India. I work uh -huh. in the Urban Development Ministry of the National Right. And uh, we work in uh, the 100 Smart Cities mission. Right. So I was just curious from where you are in uh, C40, what do you think India is doing well and uh, what do you think we need to do better? Ah. Oh. <laughs> Well, so we, we, we've certainly been supportive of the 100 Smart Cities initiative, which I think is you know, exactly the right kind of thing to do at scale, lots of places at once, lessons learned, uh, attracting good investment. I, I, the things within the very active C40 Indian member cities uh, that really strike me <clears throat> when we started that clean uh, climate budgeting program that I talked about, the first city, we thought this is going to be London and Paris putting their hands up to say they're interested. Mumbai was the first city uh, that said that it wanted uh, to look at this and has started through that huge municipal administration in Mumbai. This is through the, the commissioner in Mumbai. Um, I forget how many, I think it's hundreds of thousands, not tens of thousands of people are employed in, in that uh, city. He saw this straight away as 
a, a good governance opportunity. This is a way to streamline, to make government more efficient, a clear central goal um, with indicators that everybody can understand that can be universal across all departments uh, and then can drive innovation. And you know, we've noticed we've been talking about electric vehicles. Normally now on a, on a, on a slide when we talk about the cities that are moving fastest, Mumbai is the new city in there. The one that just suddenly the volumes have gone from the one or two pilots to the thousands uh, coming through on the streets. And I know that's also on the back of, you would know better than me, but it seems to be quite a considerable municipal investment in renewable energy. So clearly, again, you maybe you need to tell everybody, but the incentives at the, at the federal level are clearly right to make that uh, a, a plausible uh, possible thing um, at, 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 the, at, at the city level. I think, you know, the, cha you know, the challenge most definitely, you know, no surprise to anyone, is, is, is the air pollution. Because when you just, you know, just looking at the, the levels of pollution in those big cities, it, it is not possible to have, in the long term, to have a successful society with that level of ill health being caused by, by traffic pollution. And that's very clearly the, the message that, that, that China has understood. And I think the thing that India can really take from China is you can change this really, really quickly. But Beijing's halved its air pollution in eight years. And I bet now with that, le with that learning, you could probably do it in four years because the understanding is there. And the, the, particularly on the vehicle side, the, the get into very soon to, to parity and, and beyond with, with, it, with vehicle electrification. I, that seems to me for, I mean, I've been mean, honest on a personal level. I don't put my hand up for the trip to Delhi at the moment. I've got asthma. And I, I don't want to risk being in a city with that level of, of air pollution. And for places that need to attract, I'm not, I'm not including myself in this, but the top talent around the world, you need to have an offer that come and live in a healthy environment that's beautiful and and green and safe. So I think that's the thing that needs to change. Thank you for those observations and those uh, very, very impressive figures coming up from China. Mm -hmm. um, audience on the right. Yes, great. Uh, question. Uh, Hi. Hi, I'm Shaolin from um, Silver Service College. Question. Um, how does, um, rather, how does the governments ensure that the other poor are not left behind um, when they move forward in, you know, leading climate action? Yeah, and I this this I think is the is is a top priority for across most of our mayors. Um, you know, not not least because absolutely the urban poor have got left or have suffered more in climate impacts thus thus far. And in in a lot of the global south cities, thirty forty percent uh, of the population living in living in informal settlements. I, 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 you know, part of it, what we're seeing in, in, in the cities that are really focusing on this and the way that C40 is trying to go about it is to have a dual starting point for action. So, you know, one thing's just got to be the data and the science. Where are the emissions highest? Where's the opportunity to reduce them fastest and make the biggest difference for the long term? But the second lens is where is it that action can most benefit the least well off and the most vulnerable and particularly in terms of, of, of secure jobs and therefore giving uh, income and, and, and pride and I you know we're seeing this in all sorts of unexpected ways now one of, one of the things I'm really excited to do on the on this trip is we're going uh, going to Quezon City Manila where Mayor Belmonte there partly out of the experience of um, food shortages during the pandemic and the reliance on on on, on shipping in food has now stimulated a, a new urban farming um, industry, I guess, in the hinterlands of, of, of Quezon City. Um, and and this, is not, this is not a kind of window dressing, let's have some nice, a nice little farm here that, that school children can go and see how food's produced. 16,000 new jobs in the space of a couple of years created there. And mostly this is jobs created for people who were on subsistence income possibly doing three or four kind of different jobs in, in the outskirts who can turn a plot of land near to where they live into something that is now commercially viable in the way that that 
community agriculture. Similarly, thinking around nature based in, I think, I think quantitatively the poorest city in C40, um, Freetown in Sierra Leone, where in the, in the Civil War, um, the tree cover around the city was essentially destroyed, um, causing now really big problems in, in, in flooding. Uh, there, Mayor Aki Sawyer has, has made tree planting her number one priority. Again, not in a tokenistic way, a million trees, it's always a million trees. They really have planted a million trees uh, in, in Freetown, but it's a resilience initiative, but it's a, it's a new economic opportunity because they're creating a, a, a new bio industry there, medicinal uh, products out of that, those, that, those new forests. It's not monocrop, it's a, a variety of, of trees and bushes and shrubs and plants being chosen because they have a commercial um, op, uh, uh, properties, opportunity, new bio institute in, in, uh, invested and a really big trading program. So the, the poorest people in those informal uh, settlements are getting the opportunity, even if it's the first jobs don't require very high levels of educa educational attainment, but it's monitoring the trees, the planting themselves, the going back and the, and the looking after. So yeah, I think you know everywhere, and, we, and we've got a particular program on this. It's, it's, it's inclusive climate action program uh, that in, a, in, in all of our cities is working with local communities to, to build the trust and the faith that actually you know most people don't like change. Uh, people are scared of change, that actually this is a change for the better. This rapid shift to a clean economy is going to create more opportunity. And, and I think it all also boils down to leadership. As you mentioned, mm. the leadership of these cities. Uh, even the leadership of these cities, uh, I think uh, Mayor Ose Hon, who is your uh, chair. Yeah, vice chair, yeah. Vice chair of C40 uh, makes it a point to say he, he doesn't want to leave anyone behind. Yeah. Whatever he does. So, and I would imagine it's also bringing it to the international agenda. Leave no one behind. Absolutely. I think that's a very important call. And as you said, I think whatever one city does actually can be replicated. You could share the experience and learn from others and implement it quickly. Because, uh, like I said, the mayor of Darwin is busy also planting million trees. Right. Because they have typhoons that knocked out all the trees down. And he could learn, I think, from economic planting. And that's yeah. an interesting aspect. because. We, we know like uh, cities like Seoul, cities like Osaka, the famous for the ginkgo trees in the right. cities, but uh, there's no way harvesting the ginkgos. Right. Uh, uh, you know, ginkgo nuts are wonderful for dementia, etc. It's all on the ground. Right. <laughs> so so that, that's an interesting point uh, that, that you raised. Are there any other questions? Uh, Elaine, you have a question? Yes. Um, thank you very much. Hi, Mark. Hi. Um, you have uh, spoken rather positively about China's transformation in dealing with their climate uh, goals um, and does imply strong political will, speed and a certain boldness as well. But then not every city is Shanghai no. or Beijing mm -hmm. um, and there are cities where there is a stronger private sector or community. Mm -hmm. So, so in, my question then is where, are, where do you think are the points of convergence where we can connect uh, certain top-down national goals uh, at the same time leverage uh, the private economic interests and the community aspirations? Are there any points of convergence that we can harness or leverage? Yeah, really great question. And I, and I, I think I, I think kind of two, for me, there's two sides to that answer. One has got to be what is the model of consumption that can develop in China and in the rest of the world that's going to lead to higher quality of material life without ever increasing per capita non renewable resource consumption? And you know that is that's the big that's the big challenge for mission driven commerce now when we're seeing a lot of big firms who are genuinely grappling with that trying to change their business model so <clears throat> they can expand or maintain their business without constantly incentivizing people to consume stuff that they don't need don't need to you know and i and i think that where this kind of crosses over into the other side i really saw this when i worked when i was in in china and i think a where, where there's real leadership in Singapore as well is in the in the port industry 
because here you, you've got a coming together of often publicly owned or strongly regulated port facilities with largely privately owned shipping companies and then commerce writ large, but in particular the very large international manufacturing and distribution companies, the Amazons, the Alibabas, etc., where there's a lot of genuine leadership, you know, Merce, Costco, Amazon, uh, I'm not so sure about Alibaba, but you know, don't, don't, that may be just my lack of knowledge, have set really genuine, tough decarbonisation targets, but none of them can be successful unless all of them are successful. So you can't decarbonise the shipping sector with any one of those actors going first because it you need for the for the Maersk to be confident about the massive investment in a new fleet of container ships that will run on green ethanol methanol or whatever or that are able to plug into electric power when they're in dock rather than running their diesel engines they need to know that the ports the big ports in the world are going to have those facilities ready and waiting for them. The ports are only going to do that if they know the shipping companies are going to do it. The shipping companies are only going to make that investment if the demand is there from the from the from the big retailers <coughs> who will need to show that in their own carbon accounting. <coughs> and that's only going to really matter matter to those companies if they are taking their carbon accounting to include the consumption of their products, not just the production of them. And so I think there's a real, you know, here there's a, a chance for a new a model of commerce to emerge and some of the leadership that's been shown at the moment is Singapore is one of the uh, one of the few ports in the world that's committed to try and create a green shipping lane between Singapore and another C40 uh, Los Angeles. Los Angeles and Shanghai have committed to launch a, a green shipping lane. I was down at the the port in um, in Shanghai while I was there <laughs> you know, absolutely blown away by this I mean it's scary this massive facility oh. And there are no human beings there. It's just run by AI, uh, right down to the deliver the vehicles moving these massive containers. Decide when they need a break because they're getting a bit hot, and take themselves off for a, a little break or to recharge their batteries. But in all of that automation, there is there is there's extraordinary focus on efficiency, and therefore the pot this in the new part of the Shanghai port is fully electrified, and all of the boats there uh, can plug in. So I think you know that's where I see the you know the real kind of the, the shift in the private sector in, in China needing to happen in concert with the, with the public leadership. I think in some ships they're also experimenting with wind power as well. Wind yeah, power. I heard that, yeah, yeah. It's sort of just plug and uh, play, so to speak. Um, I think we're running out of time, and there, there are a couple of other questions that we really want for, uh, you to speak on, and they're going to be quick fire. All right. I'm not, we've seen I'm not good at short answers, so I'm going to have to work hard here. <laughs> well, you've been very generous with your comments about Singapore. Uh, thank you very much for that. But uh, if there's one big area you think Singapore can improve on and learn from other cities, what would it be? Besides, of course, you mentioned in Oslo, the capital. The climate budget. You, you're not doing climate budgeting. Well, they have, I, mean, I, I mean, I guess learn from other cities, it's hard. Because, I mean, it's obvious the biggest challenge here is the the lack of space to do renewable energy, isn't it? And I, I don't, I don't, I, there is not an example in the world that's done that better. You know, I, I guess my, I guess my answer would be, I've all, you know, Singapore to me has always been the kind of beacon of livable cities and innovation. And you were always the first in doing things. Seeing what's happening in some of those Chinese cities now, I think, you know, some, they're going a bit faster now. There's some innovation that's happening there. So how, how are they doing that? In a way that you're not now. I don't know what the answer is, but I, I think I think the gaze towards some of those fastest moving Chinese cities. Thank you, thank you for that. And um, what's your wish and expectation for COP28 from the point of view? My wish is that we're going to get four or five major countries standing up at at COP28 alongside city leaders and saying that they commit to really seriously looking at how action at that city level could allow their national commitment to get to what science demands in time and that they're going to work on that. In a, in a, I don't hope for anything more than a commitment to look at it, but to look at that and come back to 
come back to it with a with a with a with a definite thing in Brazil. You know, I'm not. I, I, I'm an optimist about everything. I'm, I can't be massively optimistic about the outcome. I've got, but I do, the thing that really does seem to be on the table is uh, a genuine commitment to treble renewable energy installation by 2030. And the UAE is is really moving on that. And I, and I think they're going to announce. Hopefully, they're going to announce you know some major new investment funds to make that happen. Um, is there any representative from NCCS here? No one? Right, then I thought they might want to ask a question because they're, they're co-organizing the Singapore Pavilion, yep. uh, COP28 as well. Of course, uh, you're, you're invited to speak at uh, one of the yes. sessions. Yep. Uh, looking forward to that as well. Now, we just have a few minutes left. I'm just going to do some quick fire, personal, one word questions. Oh, God. Because I read in your CV, uh, one word was responses. Uh, you're, uh, while you're not working in the DUC40 stuff, you climb mountains. What's your favorite mountain to climb? Minith Klangors. So the back of my house in Wales. Okay. <laughs> right. What's your favorite undiscovered band? Well, I'd say, oh, it's got to be one word. Divorce. 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 They're a, a band from Nottingham. Female-fronted band that sing very witty songs about modern life. Hey, we'll, we'll, we'll tune in on Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> I've not heard of this undiscovered that. Favourite EV? Favourite EV? You know, it's now got to be the, I don't know what it was called, the new uh, GAC, the new Guangzhou. I'm just going, it's just a normal family car, but it $25,000 for an electric car with a 780 kilometre range on it. I'd be happy with that. Yeah. I think so. I don't think that's available in Singapore. Uh, to be fair, I don't think it's available in China yet. <laughs> it's only in the showroom. <laughs> Ponto Automated Company. Yeah. Automotive Company. Right. Favorite city where you're going to retire to? Oh. <laughs> Addis Ababa in my dreams. Addis Ababa. All right. Okay, I because have to ask you why. <laughs> <laughs> it is, I mean, I've been. So many cities around the world, obviously. Just the friendliest, most welcoming, but also I love the fact that it's so close to the Rift Valley, the as far as we know, the birthplace of humanity. Wow. And you can go into a rickety little museum in Addis Ababa and see the bones of Lucy, the, the oldest Homo sapien that has yet to be discovered, and then take a trip down that Rift Valley where all human life came from seeing still the extraordinary nature uh, that's all around you there incredible diversity of animals and plants and uh, it's a kind of just a, I think it helps sort of reflect I'd like to think uh, you know if I'm coming to the end of my life kind of being somewhere where all all life all human life began would be rather amazing that's a historian you speak <laughs> yeah, yeah of course we'll welcome you to Singapore it is also true because I am really really proud because he's, he's the mayor of, of the city where I've lived for most of my life mm -hmm. mayor Sadiq because he, he brought in earlier this year, he expanded the ultra low emission zone, which is the, the toughest regulations on vehicle emissions anywhere in the world. And he expanded it from only two years ago, a very small zone in the centre of London that Boris Johnson brought in, and then the whole of inner London, and now the whole of metropolitan London, 11 million people. Almost everybody abandoned it. Not C40, supporting that policy. Not just his political opponents, as you would expect, but the leader of his own party, Kim Song, uh, came out against it just before it came in because there was a massive kind of climate denier, delayer, conspiracy theory there that backlash against it. And he didn't back down because he believed in the policy, he believed in the data, he knows it's going to be successful. He knew people in which they saw it. And he stuck to his guns, and I, you know, I'm just really proud of him for doing that. Right. And, and we, we do hope that Mayor yes, Sadiq can will come to Singapore soon. If, if like, not, yes, please, please help us. If not, uh, his uh, right hand woman, uh, Deputy Mayor Rodriguez, mm -hmm. was really instrumental in applying this yes, policy. Absolutely. So, right, one last question What keeps you awake at night? <laughs> okay. Wow. 
the, I mean, the, God, the, the truthful answer is, I'm not oh. enough. You know, this is, a, we're in a, I mean, I guess like most people in this room, and I definitely, I, I have the privilege of the most extraordinary, happy, exciting life. Uh, but on the other hand, we're working with the day-to-day -day reality that um, you know, we're, we're in danger of wiping ourselves out. And uh, we're, we're the people with the knowledge of that reality and a, a lot of the means to to change the course that we're on. And I, it, it generally does keep me away at night. You know, what, was today a useful day? Did I do everything I could today to, to change that reality? Um, whilst I've been here, though, there's more flipping out to the air conditioning. <laughs> having to have air conditioning on to stay to, to be able to sleep at night, coming from a, a cold car. <laughs> I haven't adjusted to that yet. <laughs> well, suddenly you're a very magnanimous and thought-provoking yet sobering trunk. You know, they used to say, "Buy that night and tiger." I think we should buy you a drink after this. <laughs> it, Asia's uh, top twenty, uh, ten of top uh, Asia's top twenty bars are just exhausted. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we need to loosen you up. Uh, I'm sobering, <laughs> sober thinking, <laughs> so to speak. But uh, I, I think Mark, you, you really, really imparted a lot of wisdom, and you really talked about what you're doing at C40, what C40 cities are doing, what the mayors and the leadership of these cities are doing to lead the way. Um, uh, thank you for sharing your ideas and your many astute observations, many things we can learn from. Thank you very much for that. We, we hope to continue dialogue with C14 and continue the discussion and partnership going into the future. And on that uh, note, uh, like everybody really to put hands together to, to thank uh, Mark for his very insightful thoughts and conversation. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I'd like to now invite Michael to present a token of appreciation to Mark. Oh, uh, Edie. Some serious publications here. Okay. But our propaganda, so to speak, this uh, document, uh, articles we work with, with CDs, uh, public sector companies, etc. It comes out twice a year. So this is for you. Thank you. And we look forward to a C40 uh, article one day as well. All right. All right. And this is uh, something which uh, uh, Elaine and team have done with uh, five cities around the world, working with the Urban Land Institute in residents. They include cities like Hong Kong, Rotterdam, and yes. Miami, for example. So that's for you too. Is okay. this all part of how can we sleep better? Uh, <laughs> yes, and it's for your aeroplane reading as well. And your three, three week uh, right, go around. So, so let's do this. Uh, uh, okay, we have already one, one, two, three, one more, one, two, three. Okay, Dee, would you like to try? Yeah. Come, we can try as well. Okay. I don't even feel all We have a variation now, we'll do this one. Yeah. <laughs> okay, ready? One, two, three, one more, one, two, three. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.